Okay, so uh, we're on to the next session. It's rushing through. Uh, so uh, this is a session on federated analytics. We've got three great speakers. We've got Phil, Rebecca, and Blaze. And uh, the first uh, uh, cab off the rank will be uh, Phil. Um, where federated analytics has already been mentioned a few times, the importance of being able to not think about just querying one particular TRE, uh, having this kind of one-to-one -one relationship between your, um, your researcher and the data custodian, but thinking about it as a scale up and scale out. So we're able to have multiple TREs as part of uh, a research question, and we're able to readily, quickly add new TREs to the, those questions. Um, so this is a challenge. Um, as uh, Simon uh, Thompson, who is probably still in the room and will undoubtedly ask a question, um, said yesterday, um, you know, the business models of TREs are important and, and actually the business models of TREs at the moment aren't really to support federation, they're to support access control. So this is a real challenge, both not just from the technically, technical point of view, but also from the governance point of view. So we're going to hear from Phil first. Uh, Phil is Director of Health Informatics at the University of Nottingham, uh, where he's been pioneering federated tools at scale, including uh, CoConnect, which we've heard a little bit about uh, for COVID. He leads the digital research service there, and he's also co-lead of Federated Analytics in Health Data Research UK. So Phil, can I invite you to take the platform? Thanks very much, Carol. And, and before I start, actually, there's, uh, I'd like to thank Carol for being our, our eagle that's above us, controlling us, looking after us, uh, and also Jill in the audience who chaired uh, a lot of our working program uh, as, our, uh, as our patient rep, but also really helped us there. Um, and also Tom Giles, who's probably watching online for being our very enthusiastic and energetic mouse running around, getting everything going. So thank you, Carol, for the, the mouse and the eagle. Um, the other thing I think is really interesting, actually hearing what Carol was talking about this morning about Elixir UK, all of this started with a one-day hackathon in Nottingham where we brought a few people together, kind of going, wonder what would happen if we combine this with this with this? And in one day, we kind of had enough understanding of how that might work to then actually feed into the application that went into Dare UK. So something quite short and, and kind of just one day of effort brought a whole new community together that wasn't working together previously. So those hackathons uh, and the, the bottom-up community efforts can be really important in that regard. Uh, so Carol had 10 years in 10 minutes. I've, I'm slightly easier task. I've got seven, month, seven months in seven minutes. Um, and really what I wanted to emphasize, because we've only got a short amount of time, I'm not going to go into the detail, um, but really we had uh, a desire not to build any new standards, not to build anything new, but to take existing standards that are already available, assemble them to solve the problem. Um, and so very much working on Elixir UK standards and uh, with GA for GH. Uh, the other thing that's really important is the evolution, not revolution, of the data governance. Uh, some of the times, as a, as a kind of a crazy software engineer, you can think you can change the world by software. Uh, doesn't always work quite out like that. So we've really tried to understand how can we embed the governance components within uh, the standards that we're doing. So a lot of the work was on adopting the five says within some of these components. Uh, I think the, the pre-competitive component is really, really important. So you hear from other speakers that have worked together with us in a pre-competitive way to really collaborate on the standards, collaborate on uh, the, the, the working together, but then actually competing on the implementation. And I think it's a really important concept here. We brought people together in a pre-competitive way to collaborate on the standards and then compete on the implementation. And one of the other things more in general, we can't do this alone. So if you're in the audience, we have some questions about existing uh, commercial TRE suppliers. There'll be commercial federated learning platforms, federated analytics platforms out there. Come and talk to us because we want to work with you. What we're trying to achieve here is a mechanism to deploy federated analytics. We don't think there'll be one platform. There's going to be multiple platforms. We don't think there'll be one TRE. There'll be multiple TREs. So how can we get that to work together? There's a QR code on the bottom there if you want to scan it to, to sign up to our main list where you'll get notifications of events and things that are going on as well. So please, please join, please talk to us uh, and kind of come on our, on our journey. So Terrifics, um, 
is a, it was a program trying to understand. We've got multiple different suppliers. Uh, so in our case, uh, we've got the, the two speakers here that will talk more specifically about DataShield and Bitfound, and then we had multiple TRE providers. At the moment, that's a really tricky space to navigate because every tool wants a new bit of software installed, and there's multiple different TREs. So every time you want to do a federated analytics program, that is really quite hard to get over the line. Multiple platforms, multiple providers, multiple pieces of software. And there's a lot of chaos in the middle. So how can we strip away that chaos? So step one was the, the assembly of existing standards. <clears throat> now this probably is looking a little bit small um, on the slides here, but what we've tried to do is, is take something that's already out there in terms of the RO crates and Stian and Carol are kind of our experts uh, there on that topic, but embedding the five safes within it. So it, the RO crate is a wrapper. It's a way of expressing uh, all the things that we want to do, the, the workflows, the metadata, the provenance. But we now embed into that also the five safe principles. Wherever it moves, there's always a, a hook back to who is the person, what's the project, what's the data. So it's really important that we have that wrapper available and it's all open there. <clears throat> Sorry, and it's a profile that's available. You can go and look at it, comment on it, and join us uh, working together on that. The other really important part was then workflows, making sure we've got a, a way of expressing the analysis that wants to be performed on the data in a way that can be reproduced on multiple different environments. So we've taken, again, borrowed a lot in terms of workflows uh, with the workflow hub that Carol mentioned this morning, but also a workflow execution service that's available from the teams in Barcelona from uh, the Spanish node in Elixir. So we've got a way of packaging and bringing everything together. And we've got a way then of representing the workflow and the analysis job that you want to run on that data. And we've got the execution service that can actually process that workflow and run it within an environment. These are already existing, well-used, open source, open community standards. We haven't developed them. We've just borrowed them and assembled them together. So when it comes to the, the data governance, one of the things we wanted to try and understand is what has to happen at what stage. So we thought about some sort of framework um, and different levels. Uh, so you, you might have a, a place where you submit the job, so you have a submission layer. That's more in the open, or it could be a service provided by TRE. But what's really important is that we don't try and override the disclosure control process, and we make sure that the TRE can always choose is this a project, is this an analysis that I want to run? So this is our early ideas. We've done some work along this in terms of having some reference implementations of how that can, can work. So there's an area where you can submit a job. There's an area where you can check for, from a TRE's point of view, is that a job I want to run? Is it a project I've said yes to? And then there's a separate area where the data is where you can actually process that job. And there we've been looking at some of the GA for GH standards around the workflow execution service and the task execution service. Again, not our work, we're borrowing and assembling that from other people. So then on the pre-competitive part, um, for me this was one of the most pleasing aspects of this work, was bringing together multiple existing platform providers, multiple existing TREs, but by utilizing the RO crates, by utilizing some of the standards from ga for gh in terms of the workflow execution, we were able to create an, an interoperable wrapper that allowed these to work, and you'll hear a little bit more um, from both uh, Bitfound and DataShield on, on some of that work and what they've been doing. But it demonstrated this work both from a TRE perspective, but also for people that have existing platforms and existing federated analytical and federated learning technologies. So join our community. Please come and uh, get involved. We've got two main ways of doing that. We are going to have a monthly drop-in technical session. So if you've heard something today, the top QR code, you can come in. Uh, all the developers on the program will be available for you to ask questions, to find out more. Please do drop into that. That's on a, the, on a Tuesday. Um, and then also we've got our, our main list again where any notifications of upcoming events and those drop-in sessions will be published out there. And just to thank uh, the much wider team than is just uh, here today in all the efforts that have gone on on just a very short seven-month program. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Phil. And we're going to be taking questions after uh, all the talks. And he was only three seconds over. So I'm incredibly impressed by that. 
Um, so uh, no pressure, guys. Um, so the next speaker is Rebecca Wilson. Um, she's a fellow of public health uh, policy and systems at the University of Liverpool, uh, where she's also a data scientist in the NIHR Advanced Research Collaboration Northwest Coast and a core developer on DataShield, which is a software for distributed analysis of sensitive health data. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with DataShield, and it's certainly widely used in Europe. Uh, so, um, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Can, you. can everybody hear Rebecca? No, nobody can hear you. Oh, I need to stick it should be switched on automatically. There we go. Um, also, the voting mark, maybe? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Hello? Oh, right, that's better. Um, right, thanks for bearing with me. Right, so um, DataShield is an analysis tool that can operate in a couple of different ways. Um, every function in DataShield, analytical function in DataShield, can operate in a standard meta-analysis sort of way. So this is where the data is held in different locations um, and analysis is done at each site independently uh, on the individual level data that's held in those locations. Um, and in this way, you're getting back essentially aggregated results across your network. Um, every function in DataShield can also run in a federated um, analysis way through a distributed approach. And what this means is that um, the data are again are located in separate locations and components of the analysis are conducted at each location. And then what we can do is mathematically combine these components and the output given is identical to the output if you had physically moved that data into a central uh, data location, like in a, in a national TRE, for example. So how does DataShield achieve this? Um, well, every function has been written from scratch. So we have developed um, the statistical methods from scratch and we have um, uh, um, embedded these in our functions um, to operate and to, uh, to, run this, to run in this way um, to ensure that um, the outputs are identical from the distributed approach to as if you had physically pulled the, lo uh, the data. And also, um, we only make use of low dimensional non-disclosive summary statistics when any information leaves the data owner as well. So um, this isn't an infrastructure talk, so if anyone is interested in how the infrastructure is um, comprised, that, um, I've just put some references there on the bottom right of the slide. Um, fundamentally, DataShield is based on open source software. It's free and um, the code is all publicly available. I guess um, in terms of TRE, um, uh, spaces, the whole system can operate as a, is operating as one big federated TRE where each component is being, um, is, is being managed and um, has the oversight of the, the person that's owning that component. But also DataShield is highly customizable and can be integrated into um, lo loads of different infrastructures and, and different sorts of uh, TREs as well. Um, the da this data shield approach offers um, a higher privacy approach to data analysis than perhaps the standard meta-analytic and pooled data analysis methods. Um, and this is because of a few reasons. Firstly, the analyst um, does not view the individual patient data during the analysis, and they actually cannot connect to it directly either. Um, all the analysis on the individual level data occurs solely with the site of the data owner. It's not done where the analyst is located. And finally, uniquely in DataShield, um, we've actually embedded automated checks into each function. Um, and these checks occur during the analysis and on any information leaving uh, the data owner site and also any information um, being sent back to the analyst. And so in this way, and also only data owners can actually set the thresholds of these automated checks. This is just a snapshot quickly to show the range of functionality that um, exists in DataShield. Um, that these libraries are at different levels of um, testing and use with real world data. Um, in green, we have the core platform um, libraries, uh, which are fully tested and used with real world data. 
It's about 150 functions um, that run across exploratory analysis, data shaping, graphical and, um, outputs, and regression and modeling, as well as functions and libraries for um, developers to build their own tools and software um, in this platform. Um, so briefly, applications of um, data shield. So, um, how is DataShield being used? So um, Germany is probably leading the way with the use of DataShield for federated analysis of healthcare data. And this is something they've been doing with DataShield since about 2018. Um, two of the funded uh, projects in the 400 million euro medical informatics initiative in Germany use DataShield as their federated analysis platform. Um, separate to this, uh, the NFDI for Health program in Germany is a 10-year funded program that has a similar sort of um, remit in parts of um, uh, activities in HDR UK and DARE UK. Um, as part of this, they're building a fair national he health research data infrastructure, and DataShield is one of the two selected federated platforms to be used in that national infrastructure. In terms of UK applications uh, with specifically healthcare data, um, we're, just winding, uh, we're just finishing up a proof of concept with Lancashire Hospitals uh, Teaching Trust, uh, where we've um, implemented Data Shield within the infrastructure for the NHS Northwest Secure Data Environment, and we're planning um, steps towards a regional pilot next. Um, as we've heard from uh, the previous talk um, in Trifix, Data Shield, we adapted, some infra we adapted our infrastructure to be um, compatible with the five safes RO crates, um, allowing our automated checks in Data Shield that that metadata and that information be carried in those crates through into, an, um, into the analysis chain. Um, basically, the introduction of GDPR has meant that um, Data Shield is very popular in European consortia, longitudinal studies, um, also now federated omics studies um, and across exposome research in Europe as a way to co-analyze uh, co data being held across multiple countries. Two of the four um, emergency horizon funded programs looking at um, post-COVID infection research were fu uh, also use the Data Shield as their analysis platform. It's not just in Europe, um, it goes beyond the uh, several global networks that are using um, Data Shield as well. Um, data Shield is standing up to um, very diverse uh, data protection legislation in four continents. Um, and these are longer term programs that are many, many um, years uh, uh, longevity, basically. Um, and then um, more recently, we've had. Um, several organizations in the clinical trial space that have been looking at data shield or evaluating data shield's federated anal analytic capabilities. Um, ICON conducted a study uh, across three sites with um, data about uh, post-vaccine syndrome after the COVID vaccine. And they noted that um, that the, um, they were able to make use of the full information from decentralized um, individual data with high levels of privacy. Separately to this, Roche also have used um, Data Shield in a study. They compared the Data Shield analysis approach compared to their classical approaches for clinical trials um, analyses. And um, I have to see if I, can, I can't read the slide, I'm afraid. Um, Let's see what they said. Um, they, the, the approach through Data Shield guaranteed better protection for data confidentiality than classical approaches. And they also stated that this type of study could ultimately facilitate research carried out using patient data to validate the effectiveness of new drugs, improve care pathways, or facilitate epidemic monitoring. I am a little bit over, but I do have one final slide um, which relates to something, some stuff that. Um, the previous session we're discussing about sustainability. So in summary, uh, Whistletop Store, Whistle Stop Store of Data Shield, um, it's an established open source uh, tool for federated analysis with automated checking built in. It's got 10 years use with real world data. There's currently about 250 million pounds worth of funded academic programs that are currently reliant on Data Shield, and that is a really conservative estimate um, because these are only the projects we even have heard of. Um, and so Data Shield really is a core analytic piece of software in the health research domain space. 
challenges. So, um, being an open source project, our biggest challenge is the sustainability of this piece of software and keeping it open source and maintaining it free to use in the long term. The reality is that investment is required to maintain the base platform that others are building their services and their research programs and analytical tools on top of. And we need this um, we need to invest. Uh, we need this sort of investment to ensure that the software quality maintains a high standard, and that we have robust testing frameworks in order to incorporate these open source libraries that are being built by other research groups, SMEs, and industry around the world. However, none of that is research, and so my final plea, my final plea, is that. Can we please start considering open source software, uh, especially those being used for research, in the same way that we do core data sources and infrastructure for research in order so that we can actually have a way to sustainably preserve them for future use in health research? Thank you. Thank you very much, Becca, and uh, I totally agree with your, your plea at the end. That was very heartfelt and, and well, well taken. Uh, our final speaker is Blaise Thompson from Biffont, which is one of our um, exhibitors and a commercial representative. Blaise has a PhD in information engineering from Cambridge and a master's in philosophy, I mean proper philosophy, not, you know, for uh, uh, MPhil, like real philosophy stuff, um, and where he specialised in the philosophy of privacy. So there's something to talk to him over a pint. Um, he was um, head of Cambridge UK Engineering Office of Apple, uh, where he was the chief architect of Siri Understanding, so it's his fault. And um, he's now the CEO of Biffont, platform for privacy preserving federated AI and data science. So thank you very much, Blaze. I thank you for letting me tease you, as ever. No problem. I, I only take some of the blame, though. I think uh, <laughs> there were many problems when I, when I joined Apple. Um, OK, so um, I'm here to oh, uh, talk about, uh, mostly about taking our platform, which is designed to be a federated data platform. Uh, and actually, I, I, I saw some of what Apple was doing uh, training on on phones when I was there, and I thought this is really cool. How can we take that kind of concept uh, and use it in other industries, particularly in healthcare? Um, and now that we've been kind of more involved in the community, especially in the uh, Terrifics projects in the DARE program, we've come to realize that uh, there's this thing called Five Safes that everyone keeps talking about. Um, but Five Safes was really designed for uh, the traditional setting where you've got people that are coming in to an environment that are going to just use that data in that one location. Um, but Five Safes is also how people think about uh, kind of protecting access to data, in, certainly in the UK, but possibly across the world. So we got to thinking, well, how, how does Five Safes work in this federated uh, setting, which people keep talking about here, yeah? and uh, had some great great work with, um, with Phil and with others, uh, with DataShield as well, in this most recent uh, Terrifics project and also previously uh, in the DARE program. So what I want to do is talk about kind of taking federated AI and analytics and bringing it to five safes or, or vice versa. Now, people have talked about federated AI and analytics many, many times, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, what are we talking about? The core idea here and the core problem is that we can't transfer data out of these uh, kind of silos of data, but it's possible that we're able to transfer algorithms into those data silos. And so that's the core kind of concept of uh, federated analytics uh, or AI. Um, now, why do you want to do that? Well, there are quite a lot of reasons. Um, so, so Becca was just talking about kind of more uh, statistical type of reasons why you do that, secure aggregation and, and so on. Um, there are, there's quite a lot of interest at the moment in federated learning of models. So you might have more and more data sets in, in remote areas. You want to train a shared model using all of that data, but you can't transfer the data out. And especially now with foundation models, you want to get access to more data than you could possibly have uh, in one, one site. Uh, a second reason might be that you agree that you want to calculate kind of overlaps. You know, 
uh, I've got my GP list of patients, and you have your hospital list of patients. We want to find the people that are in both. Um, but neither side, because of GDPR or other privacy concerns, is willing to share what's not uh, in the list. We just, we're only happy to share things that we know are in both places, because those are the people that have consented. Um, and there's a technology for doing that as well, called private set intersection, uh, which is also uh, built in our platform. Uh, another problem that's coming up more and more is just evaluating AI models or analytics type models. Um, especially in the context of health equity, you kind of want to make sure that a model that's built on one hospital's data at least will work in other hospitals' data, um, and, and similarly for, for other industries. Uh, and then a, a, a fourth example, just to give here, and I'm sure there are many more, uh, is when you want to do benchmarking, but you might not be happy uh, to share that you're actually the worst performing uh, surgeon in the country or something like that. Um, but you do want to know that you're the worst performing surgeon so that you can do something about it. Well, this is also a technology which can enable that, where you, you kind of group together a whole bunch of people and you say, look, let's at least work out what the average is here. Um, well, we can calculate that without anyone disclosing how they're doing, uh, which can be very, very valuable. So those are just a few examples of why you might want to do this. So let's get on to uh, bringing in the five safes. So the first uh, one I'm going to talk about is safe projects. And uh, the basics of this, I think, is, is similar to a traditional safe project. So you, you need to make sure that the thing that you're trying to do uh, makes sense. So there's someone who's going to kind of set up the project or some group of people. So we call that the, the project owner. But there are slight differences here because uh, mostly due to governance, each data custodian that's bringing their data also has to make sure that they're happy with the project being a safe project. And so there are different governance models for that. You could have, uh, you could kind of entrust decisions about uh, safe projects to some third party or to a kind of committee of some kind. But you can also have a setting where every data custodian decides for, for themselves, are they happy to join this project? And so here's a screenshot of our platform where each data custodian is saying, I want to join this project or not. Another thing to think about in the federated setting um, is, is kind of more legal issues around uh, what's happening in the project. And so built into our platform, we have kind of default legal terms, but we also have an ability to override how the legals work. So who's going to own the results of this federated collaboration um, and, and so forth. And so that's something that also needs to be agreed to by all of the participants. OK, safe data. Again, I think this one is, is a bit more similar to a traditional project. But again, there's slight nuances, because each data custodian is making their own decisions about what data is being kind of used to contribute to the, data, uh, to the project. And uh, you do have to trust the data custodians now to not bring in uh, data that might poison uh, the results. So there's, there's some other slight variations. In our platform, we have uh, an ability to just kind of filter the data sets to at least make sure that you're uh, following data minimization uh, ideas. Then you've got safe people. Um, at the moment, I think, uh, at least in our platform, the way this is done is just e expecting an external approach to validating whether people have signed up, uh, not, not just signed up, but done the relevant training. But I think longer term, this, this might come through with things like GA4GH uh, passports, where you might be able to check, you know, has this person does the relevant, done the relevant training? Then you've got safe settings. You want to make sure that wherever the analysis is done, uh, it's, it's done in a safe way. And this is also, I think, a, an interesting angle, because uh, the one way we could do this is just to kind of dockerize the analysis for each project. And, and so that's kind of our default way of, of operating. But within the Terrifics project, um, in order to kind of standardize uh, several things, what we ended up doing was having this kind of task processor call out a, a separate workflow executor. Uh, so for example, Hutch, which is um, developed by Phil and his team, which does the actual execution. And then that can be put into a virtual machine which uh, can have additional protections on the, on the environment. And then uh, the safe outputs. So that's the, the fifth one. And at the moment, uh, most TREs are operating in a world where uh, they need manual disclosure checks of every output that might go on. So here, here's an example project where we just produce the result, and the results just stay within uh, the data custodian's site. 
Um, and so then they can follow whatever air locking uh, approach they want to do. But um, I think it is interesting to start thinking about how much data custodians are going to be willing to do automated uh, disclosure checks and possibly link that into what are the safe algorithms that they're happy to run within, uh, within their data uh, environment. So again, another thing in our platform is that when you set up a project, you can actually specify that you're only going to allow a certain type of task to run. So for example, I'm only, this is a project for training AI models in a federated way. I'm only going to allow federated model training as the algorithm that's going to run here. Uh, and then you might want to add privacy protections, like I'm only going to allow things that are differentially private or k-anonymous or, or similar. So just to um, talk a bit about the, the DARE programs, in the first phase, uh, there's some really interesting outputs. So one of the, we were involved in a project called Fair Treatment, which actually developed a bunch of governance frameworks, which I thought was really interesting. With uh, Terrifics, this kind of brought out this common architecture of how we do things, but also the Five Safes Aura Crate, um, which Phil also talked about, which basically kind of explains and defines what a task should be in this kind of setting. So just to summarize here, I think the Five Safes framework can fit actually eff effectively into a federated setting. Um, I think it'll be interesting uh, in the coming years to think about how safe outputs and safe algorithms might interplay with each other. Um, and actually, I think we're quite excited that Bitfounder Ready does provide quite a lot of, of what you would need in this five safes world. Um, so yeah, please feel free to try it out. It's uh, you know, just go to bitfound.com, pip install Bitfound, um, or come speak to us. We're just outside. I'd love to hear your use cases. Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for questions. So do I see any questions in the audience here? Yes, this lady here. Thank you so much uh, for these interesting talks. Um, I hope my question is not going to be a bit out of context, but I do understand that at least most of the academic institutions are working with partners outside of the UK. And I wanted to understand whether these federated approaches have been tried with partners uh, outside of the UK, and specifically I'm considering um, either Sub-Saharan Africa or the Global South in general, and how that has worked out, if it has at all, and what you perceive um, specific challenges in that context to be and whether um, you as, not you, but you know, institutions that have sort of pioneered this approach have got um, approaches on how to, you know, sort of help or bring partners up to speed on how these approaches work, basically. So who would like to take that? Yeah, I, so I think um, federated systems really come to life when you, when you go beyond just the boundaries of one country. Um, and I think it's much more obvious why you need to federate when you do go, go global. And so um, within the Health Data Research UK Federated Analytics Program, we're really trying to understand that from this federated approach that we don't put technical barriers for other places and other countries or other data sets to actually join and be part of that network. So we're making sure that the technology isn't the barrier and that there's easy ways to get that deployed. Um, we are uh, having some really early conversations um, with uh, colleagues in Cape Town, University of Cape Town, for example, on some of their, they've done a, an amazing uh, piece of work with uh, some of their platforms and adopting the GA4GH standards as well. Uh, so we're starting to have some of those conversations, but as well as Brazil, Singapore, Australia. Um, and so it really does, for me, it comes alive when you start going beyond federating just within the UK, but actually the UK federating with the, the wider world. Um, and I think it's really important you get the data sets from, from other countries into that network rather than just being at UK data sets as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree with um, uh, what Phil just said because, um, so DataShield, um, this has been the primary purpose of why DataShield was created like in 2009 um, because there were these research data sets in different countries that Leg legislatively, they weren't allowed to physically move them outside, sometimes even the institute, sometimes the region or, or even the country. Um, 
in our experiences with sort of the global research networks, what we find is that um, it does require conversations with um, local experts in the legislation in that country, mm. local experts in, in the data protection legislation of those countries. A lot of countries are harmonizing their data um, protection legislation with, G with what's happening in Europe. A lot of other countries are taking that lead from Europe and harmonizing their um, legislation in, um, to that. Um, but also people that are responsible for data governance of data sets of that type. And I think that having that two-way conversation between those technical people <laughs> who are building these federated uh, infrastructures and tools and making sure that what you are building is flexible enough to be compatible with this variety of uh, legislative restrictions and governance restrictions. And, and that's what we've done. In, that's the approach we've taken in DataShield. Um, and because we're an open source project, um, researchers in another country can take our platform and adapt it to suit their needs. They can add on, they can create additional pieces of a middleware that gives the protections, the extra protections that they need specific for, for their legislative and data governance context. So it is possible, it's definitely possible. <laughs> I'll try to be quick to add my comments. So, um, we've not worked in, in Africa yet, but um, t two things I think have been interesting. So one is making it easy to install. We've discovered that uh, coming with like a very heavy duty installation process can be really difficult. Uh, so actually we now have a Windows application. I never thought I'd develop one of those, but, um, <laughs> but I am doing that. Um, and, and that's just because that's what people use. They, they know how to install a Windows application. Um, another interesting thing that came out of an international collaboration was uh, talking to someone in, in Hong Kong. Um, and we, we said, oh yeah, you, you want to do imaging, just use a GPU, it needs to be an NVIDIA GPU. And she said, oh, we can't get those in China anymore. Um, and that was kind of, an, I obviously knew that, but I hadn't kind of interpreted it as impacting my work. Um, and so, yeah, there are other things that you also need to think about. Um, I think that's not an issue in Africa, but uh, internationally it is. I'm going to take Chair's prerogative because I know we're a little bit uh, one minute over, but uh, there's a question online from a mystery observer, uh, which is, um, how can big pharma and industry help such platforms like DataShield, open platforms, um, can such a platform be used for RWE generation? But I think really the question is, what can industry do in order to be able to support the open source uh, platform community? <laughs> Difficult question. I mean, you know, um, I think it's, it's about finding um, a long-term sustainable funding or investment model to keep the core platform open source. Um, it's kind of like, you know, where we started, we were just one small research group, a couple of postdocs um, and building this thing. And now so many other research groups are contributing to it. But the base platform needs to be preserved. And so the only way we can do this is, is to have, have that conversation, I guess. If, if anyone's interested, come and find me. Um, have that conversation and try and find ways to, I guess, invest and sustain these. It's, it's true, there's so many, we're going to hear from other open source softwares in the next session that will, are facing the same um, situation as us, that are, are core analysis tools as well. So we're out of time. So can I just thank the panelists once again?